If you will turn to Luke chapter 6, we'll begin there. Now we're looking at the question of whether or not the usury or interest taking, interest charging, is scriptural or we are, more generally speaking, looking at the ethics of it. And we saw last time that in the Old Testament there was quite clear teaching on it that an Israelite could not charge a brother interest on anything, on a loan or goods or property. If he let him borrow them, then charge him interest for the use. A Gentile, you could, a non-Israelite. The New Testament we found there's no direct teaching concerning the taking of interest. Jesus does recognize the practice of interest taking in business. But the New Testament goes quite a bit beyond the matter of interest and deals with one's possessions. And that's why we need again to remind yourself in Luke 6, verse 30, Give to every man that asketh thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. See, that is quite a distance away from the idea of taking interest. As you would that men should do to you, do you also likewise to them, and so forth. Verse 34, if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what does it profit you? What thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners. What's their motive? To receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And so we want to begin tonight with this principle that in the New Testament, the emphasis is upon giving. In the New Testament, the emphasis is upon our willingness to give of our possessions wherever there's a need without any strings attached, without any ulterior motive, selfish motive. Now that's the principle of the New Testament that the emphasis is upon our willingness to give, not simply to lend plus interest, but to give of our possessions. Wherever there's a need without any selfish motives. Now that's verse 38 of Luke 6, which we didn't read last time. Here's the stress. Give. So he's been talking about if you lend, then don't lend just for the purpose of getting your goods back or hoping you will establish a credit rating so that when you're in need. Now the whole stress, verse 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So the emphasis upon a willingness to give, having no interest in interest. <laughs> now on the base of that, certain conclusions or observations. And by the way, we're dealing with guidelines on interest because there's no direct teaching on it in the New Testament. So all that you will get under this study will be guidelines and not rules and regulations. Remember, Christianity, but especially biblical ethics, deals with principles to follow. And I say it smiling, but people still, after you teach on a subject, come and want a direct ruling. <laughs> and that's the way the Lord teaches me patience. <laughs> I can't find a verse in the New Testament that tells us directly what to do about interest. But I can find the principle is to give of your possessions to lend asking and hoping for nothing again, well, how could you charge interest on what you don't hope for again? Verse 35, if you love your enemies and do good and lend hoping for nothing again, how could you charge interest if you lend not even considering whether or not you didn't get your goods back? God expects us to use common sense. You'll find some old lazy bum that'll ask you for your car. If he finds out that you believe in such a principle, and God doesn't necessarily mean that because he's too lazy to work or whatever, that you're supposed to give him his car and don't care whether you get it back. A little bit of common sense, and taking the whole Bible too, 
Proverbs would be a good study <laughs> for people like that because it tells you that we're to emulate the ant and the sluggard will starve to death when it gets cold. And in the New Testament, if a man doesn't work, don't let him eat. But your attitude should be toward a person who's in need, not a person who, is, who needs instruction or admonition to go to work or to take care of his family, but a uh, person who really has a need. But these are principles. So on the basis of what we said, the emphasis is upon our willingness to give then certain conclusions. And <clears throat> I think you study this as thoroughly as, well, I say as I have, you'll come out with essentially the same conclusions. One is, you'll find the New Testament principles in regard, you know, to possessions and interests and all. The New Testament principles apply to a Christian's day-to-day -day personal relationships. The New Testament principles about giving, lending, apply to a Christian's day-to-day -day personal relationships and not to society's use of money. applied in business, in trade, and in the economic order, which is our subject, the ethics of the economic order. So the teachings in the New Testament apply to our day-to-day -day personal relationship. You see a man over there, brother, or, uh, or he says even your enemy in need, meet his need. He isn't talking about how business conducts itself out there in the economic order. Now, don't get ahead of me because a Christian always acts according to the principles even out there. But anyway, the teachings here, he's talking about personal relationships of lending to people, not a person who's in business to make money at a profit. You know, he pays a dollar for his goods and must sell them for a dollar, ten or twenty cents, the item, to make a profit. That's legitimate. He's talking about our personal relationships. But not to society's use of money in trade, in business, the economic order. Another thing, since the economic order has been ordained by God, which we've already shown, Romans 13, for example, all the powers are of God, since economic order has been ordained by God, then the use of money in business and banking for the purpose of profit is not forbidden in Scripture. Since the economic order has been ordained of God, starting in the garden, he told Adam to go to work, then the use of money in business and banking for the purpose of profit is not forbidden in Scripture, either the Old or New Testament. There's nothing wrong with making a profit if it's done fairly, legitimately, and so forth because there's much teaching in the Old Testament about having uh, fair balances and just weights and measures. Uh, many of them were in business, and uh, God was concerned that they do it justly. He didn't say it's wrong to sell or to barter or to make a profit. Again, both the Old and New Testaments have reference to consumer loans on a person-to-person -person basis and not to business or production loans. All the teaching concerns consumer loans on a person-to-person -person basis and not business or productive loans. <coughs> People who fail to make a diligent study of the word sometimes uh, get a hold of a truth or a principle and then come up with wrong conclusions and they try to apply some general thing to some specific or something specific to some general situation. And if you stop to think about it, in the Old Testament he's talking about a brother lending to a brother, don't charge interest. In the New Testament he's talking about on a person-to-person -person basis, we as individual Christians should lend wherever there's a need. He isn't talking about people in business here in Luke 6, obviously. The world has to conduct itself at a profit because the economic order would, well, you would just cease, of course, to, to uh, be able to exist. So we're, we're dealing with consumer, not productive loans in the 
Bible. However, in the economic order, the conduct of the Christian is not always the same as that of the world, as we've stressed for months or the beginning of the teaching in ethics, that the ethics of the Christian is not always the same as the world. You have to keep that in mind, that <clears throat> what you may see happening even in Scripture is not always the way that a Christian would conduct himself, because some things are just records of events or transactions. So it must be based upon, well, not David killing as a warrior, but upon the full revelation that we are not to kill, for example. So the New Testament principles uh, in, say, Luke 6 and Matthew 6 and Mark 10 and passages like that dealing with possessions, the New Testament principles would suggest certain conclusions for the Christian ethic. And as I say, they suggest these things because there's no direct teaching concerning interest-taking. But if you'll study the passages on possessions and the giving and lending of goods, the Old and New Testament, of course, together, <clears throat> then you'll find certain things that would suggest themselves for our own conduct. One is that a Christian would avoid participation in the money lending business or credit plus interest selling. It would seem that a Christian would avoid participation in credit plus interest selling or the money lending business. Why? For two good reasons. At least two. One is because of Jesus' teaching on giving of our possessions. And even if we lend, not to be concerned if we get them back. Now he's talking, of course, <clears throat> to a man who uh, would let somebody an article of clothing or he had need of a lamb or something. So I said he isn't talking about giving him your house because he asked for it. But because of Jesus' teaching on giving, we've already covered that thoroughly. That would be one reason. Another reason why we wouldn't get involved in credit plus interest transactions or m the money lending business is because of the many problems that money lending and credit buying creates for the Christian. Now, the world, it would not be a problem. And it isn't a problem for most church members, but it would be a problem for enlightened Christians. Such things, when you're involved in interest-taking, credit-buying, and that sort of thing, or you're in that kind of business where you do things on credit, then you're faced with such things as foreclosures when they can't pay, the attachment of salaries. These things happen all the time. Court litigations. And not the least, loans for sinful purposes, if you're in the business, you know, of lending money. Like a liquor store. Somebody wants to build it and comes into the place, bank, or money lending office, you can't turn him down. State law would require. Uh, if he wants to take a vacation in Las Vegas uh, to get thoroughly saturated in sin, why, you have to lend him the money for that, and so on. So it would seem a Christian wouldn't be involved in that. Secondly, <coughs> The study of the whole question of interest taking and usury in Old and New Testament, especially the New, would suggest that a Christian would not charge interest. Not only would he not be involved in a business where he must get into litigations and lawsuits and so forth, he would not charge interest. He would set a fair market value for his goods. And then that would be it. Why add 6% or 8 or 10% interest if you've charged a fair value? Now, a Christian that is so concerned about profit-making should re-examine his motives and re-study the New Testament teaching concerning possessions and discipleship.
Now, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> remember that you couldn't charge a brother, but you could a Gentile interest. But in the New Testament, not only do you not charge interest, but you lend not only to your friends, but to your enemies who may not repay you, even the principal, let alone the interest. You're to lend, hoping for nothing again. So if you sell, <clears throat> for example, a car worth $500, it isn't worth $500 plus 6%. If it's worth that, and that's a fair price, then charge that price. Interest taking is, is a whole attitude and realm in itself. It is designed for the purpose of taking advantage of a person's, person's uh, inability to pay in full at the moment. And it doesn't matter what you sell. I mentioned a $500 car. It doesn't matter whether it's a house or a yacht or whatever else. Uh, why do you have to hold the paper? If they don't have the money and have to borrow it, let them borrow it from the bank. So you don't have to get involved in the interest taking even if they can't pay for it. I sold a house in Winona Lake in 63. The woman paid cash, so there's no problem. <clears throat> sold the one in Claypool. They didn't have the money. But they went, of course they don't have the faith message either, uh, but they went to the bank and borrowed it. Now, if I would have held the note, I'd have held it without interest. If you think that interest taking is the means by which you're going to get by in this world, you've missed the whole message of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. That interest taking in itself is, as I say, an addition to the fair price of the article you're going to sell. Well, people say, what of the businessman who must buy at 8% to produce his inventory, get his inventory up, or for whatever his needs, he must borrow at 8%. Then he sells on credit his appliances or goods, so he must charge more than 8 you know, to break even. He must charge 10%, we're told. Well, the question I ask is why? Now, if he is a Christian, now, of course, I'm being naive to say this, I recognize that. But if he's a Christian, then he doesn't have to be borrowing his money. I don't care what kind of a business he's in. He doesn't. Now, of course, I recognize that that is a naive statement because most people, even though they consider they accept or have the faith message, in a business of any stature, would think it inconceivable not to well, to be unable to borrow money from the bank to keep things going. Like the automobile business. All those cars sitting over there at the dealers, whether it's Cadillac or Ford or whatever, well, the dealer didn't pay for those. He doesn't have that kind of money. He buys those on consignment. The bank holds the notes. And he's waiting to sell. He couldn't conceive of having, say, 200 Cadillacs or 200 cars of any kind on his lot paid for Yet a Christian businessman could, if he had the faith message. People just don't understand that, that it works regardless because, you see, to the average Christian, believing for $10,000 is inconceivable. And so if it's just a matter of amount, the amount or degree, then 100000 or a million is no different to God than you believing for 10000 People have believed for a quarter of a million or two million or whatever, and God has given it to them. I'm talking about businessmen, 150,000. I know personally of cases. I know one, just heard one sermon I preached on Mark 11:24 and claimed a half million and got it. Riding a bicycle when he claimed it. That's how much money he had. <laughs> Well, praise the Lord. Now, not a half million to stick in the bank and say, look, God answers prayer. You see, we don't have to keep saying that. But the problem is, dear friends, when, you see, we are so oriented, brainwashed into thinking in terms like the world thinks, that it's almost impossible for the average person to honestly, sincerely come to the Bible, the New Testament, and let God speak to him about faith and finances and money. 
And we think the bigger the business or the more finances that are need, the more that we would have to let God supply through the finance company or the bank. So the problem is that too many Christians are always trying to justify why they live and think and act like the world out there. The church ethic today is not the Bible ethic, it's the ethic of expediency. You do whatever is necessary, you know, to make ends meet. Now, I wasn't the biggest businessman in town, but as I've already said, that doesn't matter how much it is, but this was even before I was saved. I had a business in Louisville, a business in Tampa, a business in St. Petersburg, Florida. And in every one of those businesses, the larger part of my sales were credit sales. And I never once had to charge one penny interest to make ends meet. Never occurred to me that I had to charge interest. And yet this is the way most people or places exist. Automobile dealers, builders, appliance stores, furniture stores, department stores. Do you realize if there's any way possible, they'll never, and of course everybody's buying on credit, they'll never give you a paper to the bank. They'll hold it themselves if they can. Why? Because the huge profits made in interest taking. I mean, your $5,000 car, they get 6000 They don't like you to come in and buy cash. No, they don't. They'll talk to a man that's got a $100 a week job and wants a Cadillac a lot quicker than the little guy to call up and what will you give me for cash? Yes, they will. Now, that's just a common fact of the business world because the money's in the interest. Those of you who still don't have the faith for believing for your house to be paid for, I just want to make a point because I used to buy them that way. I claim them paid for now. God gives them that way. The last two I've had were paid for. But you look at your payment book. Well, you know this is a fact. But I'm saying it for the benefit of those who've never bought a house on credit yet. Most of your payment is not principal, it's interest. Most of it. Not part of it. It's been so long since I've made payments, but like when I paid 100 a month on a house, which sounds ridiculous now, you can't even rent a room for that, but 100 a month, like... $80 was interest and 20 went on principal. And that went on for years like that. And you get way down until you're so old you can hardly open the front door. And then maybe half of it goes on principal and half on interest. That's literally true. A $30,000 house will cost you 60 or more. And if it's only worth 30, it's not worth 60. You try to sell it for 60. Of course, the market's going up on that, but that doesn't change the fact that that interest-taking is the world's method of making not a profit, but of exacting usury. Isn't it strange that I was in three businesses in three different cities, and most of it was credit buying, and never occurred to me to charge interest. I put a markup on it that would sell the goods, and that was it. Well... You know, it isn't like I got out of a book. As I say, I've done it myself. So it's a matter of faith. A Christian businessman who trusts God, who believes his promises, will not have to borrow. Matthew 6, 33. You seek first the kingdom of God in your life. <clears throat> he said, I'll give you all the things the Gentiles are seeking after. <clears throat> all right, he says, I can't exist. I don't see any way in this particular business to exist without the banks and the loans and all that. Then you should get out of that business where you cannot trust God to provide for you his way so that you have to use the methods of the world. Now, we make it plain here that if you're in the kind of business you can't walk totally by faith, get out of it. God doesn't want you in that. You let him provide his way and it's going to be totally faith. Borrowing money to produce money is not faith. Now, anybody ought to be able to see that. And this is a faith walk that we're called to. And this is an end-time faith ministry church and message. And we're just going to run off and leave you people that think that borrowing money is the way to get things done, to make ends meet. Borrowing money is not faith. You'll be sitting on the sidelines while we're walking on the water. <laughs> Lending money at interest or selling goods on credit and adding interest charges is not biblical ethics but the world's ethic. Interest charging 
is taking advantage of a person's inability, his weakness. Because if you had the cash, you wouldn't charge interest. And if that refrigerator is worth 500 cash, it's not worth 500 plus 10 percent interest. And there is no house that you buy for 40 worth 80 or 90 thousand. And it's mostly all interest. That's why most businesses, they can, Sears or Wards or any automobile dealer or whatever, will hold the paper if he can. Because his money is in the paper, the interest. I mean, he holds your note. Now, the world often functions and has to function in ways it's not permitted the Christian. We're trying to encourage you to trust God, not to bind you with rules and regulations. We said these are guidelines. Let me give you some economic principles to think about in light of all this. First of all, money or income, we're talking about for a Christian, money or income should be earned for goods or services rendered. Interest taking is legal theft, in my opinion and a lot of others' opinion, that money or income should be earned for goods or services rendered. Earned. You know, I've sold things or let people borrow money and things, you know, where there was no need to give it to them, they just wanted a car or something, wanted to borrow it. I, it would never occur to me to charge them interest. I just, you know, I'd have to be reminded charge interest there's just something wrong with a person's thinking as a Christian that he would charge anybody interest if it's worth 500 it isn't worth 500 plus 6 percent I think we said that but this isn't just even the Christian point of view the Greeks and the Romans despised people who took interest and the church down to the Middle Ages would not permit interest taking of its membership these are facts if you want to do studies in economics about this particular point. Uh, no point in quoting the Greeks and the Romans, but I think it was Aristotle who said money begetting money is the worst way to make money that you could imagine. And that's what interest taking it is, money begetting money. So money or income should be earned for a Christian for goods or services rendered. Secondly, money for the Christian should be only a medium of exchange, nothing else. He only sees it as a medium of exchange. <clears throat> and so money should not beget money just for the sake of making more money to beget more money. As I've already said, God permits it out in the economic order. Whether he approves it is beside the point. But he permits the police to split your head open if you disobey some law. But doesn't mean that he wants a Christian doing it. So a lot of things are permitted for the world out there because society has to continue along its way until the end. But money for a Christian should not be used to beget money. <clears throat> well, then we have a couple of questions to get raised, and we'll try to deal with those before we leave this. A couple of questions. If a businessman, or any Christian for that matter, has some money on hand and in the bank, should he allow the bank to pay him interest? See, right away, we have to answer these questions to keep him coming up here to ask them. <laughs> if a person has money in the bank, should he allow the bank to pay him interest on the money? Doesn't the bank lend out its money at 10% to pay you the five? Yes, it does. Well, let's give two or three replies to that question. First of all, overcomers will not be so concerned about accumulating money that he would have any a lot of the times as far as accumulating it. I don't consider 500 in the bank or a thousand or a couple of thousand accumulating money. <laughs> Not today. You can put that many groceries in your trunk. <laughs> but, that would bother. but I'm saying, as I'm going to say, in a moment we got to keep a balance and so we can't say, well, how much is too much or whatever. But the point is an overcomer isn't going to be concerned about accumulating money. 
If he has any, whatever amount, if God has allowed him to have some for a period, then he recognizes he's but a steward of God's possessions, that he holds that in trust. Now remember, the Bible teaches the abundant life when you walk by faith, and so you can have a home paid for and a car paid for, and some of us who are in business occasionally accumulate some because sometimes we need large amounts. Sometimes God requires we just believe for it if we need it too, and we've done that. Once I needed 16,000 right away, I'm glad I had it. Another time I needed 10, didn't have it, so I claimed it and got it the next day through the mail. I got 12 through the mail, claimed 10. So either way, and what we have, home, cars, and whatever he's allowed us not to accumulate in the sense of accumulating a lot of possessions, but what he allows us, we see it as a trust, and we wait upon him to show us how to use it and promote his welfare. So that's the first thing. An overcomer isn't going to be concerned about accumulating anything. If he has anything, and he has it in the bank or under the mattress, wherever he knows he's just stirred of God's possessions. That's where he had it before they invented banks. <clears throat> Another thing to answer that question, should we allow the bank to pay interest on money to us if we're not going to charge it? I don't think a Christian should lend his money to the bank for the sake, for the sake of getting interest. That should not be his motivation. I don't, well, I don't want to get ahead of the story until you get that down, but I don't think he should be lending his money to the bank for the sake of interest. His attitude should be that the bank is a convenience, a place of deposit. Let him put it under the mattress if it's a problem about interest taking. It's a place of deposit, a place where he can write checks, and it's a little inconvenient to send $3,900 in the mail to pay for some stock you've ordered or something. You could by face say nobody will steal that cash, but common sense would tell you checking is a convenience. And so I think we ought to keep a balance here regarding deposits in a bank. I don't think on the basis of this teaching, this is my opinion, that you should run to the bank, withdraw your money, and stick it in a sock somewhere. <laughs> it's all attitude under grace. God has permitted us to have a little right now, and, and I couldn't care less. I have no interest in interest. I can put it in the checking, and you won't get any there. They'll be lending it out anyway. They lend what's on deposit. I couldn't care less whether they pay interest on it or not. As I say, generally, the average Christian, even if he lives the abundant life, is not going to be accumulating so much. That's a problem. But I think it is getting over into legalism to sit and worry about whether this should be in a savings account temporarily just to, to keep it out of the way until I buy that house or whatever or in the checking. Do whatever you want with it if you're not interested in interest taking. And you can't raise the ethical question like, well, the bank lends that money out for uses that you wouldn't. You know, they'll make loans to a guy that wants to build a bunny club or something nightclub, liquor store. Yes, they'll do that if you have it in your checking. They lend out what's on deposit. They lend out all the money that's available on the basis of all that's available. But as I say, if that's a hassle with anybody, then you do it your way. But I think it borders on the legalistic to say that we just have to do everything a certain way. And when It's your attitude. No interest in interest. No interest in possessions, accumulation of things. If your attitude's right, then what does it matter? If it bothers you, put it in a shoebox and slide it on the bed. If that satisfies you. I mean, a good example to explain what we mean is a matter of attitude. What's the difference in a widow who has property her husband left her renting that, and that's her source of income, or selling the property and investing that, I don't mean the stock market, that's gambling, but investing that in something that will give her the same rate of income. What's the difference whether she gets it at rent or whether it pays her out of income? It's just a means of livelihood to her. If she is a faith-walking, overcoming, end-time widow, she isn't worried about it anyway because somebody can take that anyway. She's going to have to learn to trust the Lord. Oh, they often take possessions. 
Amen. That's all through church history. Amen. But you see, when you're walking by faith, Jesus says, He will give you back all. If you surrender it all to Him, He said, I'll give it back a hundredfold with persecutions in this life and the world to come eternal life. And it's very easy to overlook that little phrase with persecutions. Sometimes what you have, they will take. So if you're depending on that, then you've missed it anyway. Now, I sold two houses, both of them about double what I paid for them. Not seeing how much money I could make, but the market had gone up. Because when I bought a house, I paid double what it would have sold for if I'd have bought it 10 years ago. You see, well, profit, profit in what sense? If I have to buy a house, which I did, then I have to pay more than it's worth, which is what happened. If I would have held the paper on it, I would have held it without interest. Because I say, I've done that enough to know that I'm not just talking words. I don't have any interest in interest. Didn't have an interest in interest when I was unregenerate. Didn't occur to me that that's the way to do business. And yet I always paid it. Always had to pay it. Well, to me, that is what the Bible says about usury or interest. Usury is a perfectly good word in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Remember, it means taking excessive interest. Well, I trust we answered all your questions about it, but you can't, as I say, get down into the place where you legislate how we conduct every detail of our lives. Even a Christian businessman who should trust the Lord and not give or take interest He's going to have to work and live on principles, yeah. not legislate what you can do or what you can't do. And if he learns to trust God, God will provide. He won't have to borrow. As the Old Testament said, he'll be a lender and not a borrower. Praise the Lord. Well, looks like um, we start a new heading. <laughs> Told you all my personal history and selling and buying and but you think about what we've taught you because there are not any specific teachings in the New Testament on interest. But the principle is very clear. We're to lend, hoping for nothing again, to give, and to set our affection on things above. And you know in your heart if you care about those things. I had to come to a decision that, you know, along the years, you have to make decisions. You have to work through these things. I've taught on this, as I say, a couple of times before. So it isn't like new to me. But in all of these things I've taught you, I've had to make decisions myself. And wherever I came to a point where I said, now wait a minute, that's robbing me of my freedom. I'm not proving a thing. If it were a test, if it was a test of ethics or a test of morality, if it was a test of faith or something, and that's another matter. I may have to do something to prove that my heart is right. So in the matter of money, I don't care whether it's in savings, I don't care whether it's in checking, I don't care if it's in under the bed or in the bureau drawer or in the bedpost. <laughs> I have carried many, many hundreds of dollars with me just around in my pocket many times. And I found I left it on the car seat, the wallet, just out there with maybe fifteen hundred dollars in. Most of them in hundred dollar bills or something. Well what I'm saying is that it doesn't occur to me to worry about it. I had a two thousand dollar camera and a trunk literally full filled with expensive goods one night in the motel and came out the next day and the trunk was up. Everything in its place. $2,000 camera near 3000 with the lens and all. All of it in its place. Nobody touched things. I cover it with the blood of Jesus and Psalm 91 and go to sleep and rest. <laughs> and my thought was, an, oh, what if? Because there are enough people out stealing CB radios that they wouldn't have missed an open trunk with all of that in it. You know, the only thing that would concern me would be some of the notes that I have for Wednesday or something <laughs> that I had in there. If I had a concern, that would be it. 
That's right. They could have the camera before they could have all of the, the years of work and labor that I put into some notes. Amen. That is true. In a motel room, if I leave my briefcase in, I open it up so they can see it's preacher stuff. So they won't run in and grab it and run out. But if you close up a briefcase, the guy, and I've had things stolen, like cufflinks and police come and want you to go to Don and identify the people. I say, well, I don't care about it. <laughs> I was over in Nassau and they stole stuff out of the suitcase and they tried and tried to get me to go down and identify the people and the goods. So they had caught the people and I didn't even know it was gone. I looked through it and he named what I had there and I said, yes, that is missing. I said, I don't care about it. I said, I'm over here for four days. I would take at least a half day, maybe all day. And my rest is worth more to me than that, to go get those goods back. It wasn't worth that much anyway, but the point is, if you are concerned, you better not take anything with you ever. <laughs> because you'll be sure to lose it. But I have, many times I've left the briefcase open so they can see there's a Bible and notes and things like that. Well, it isn't likely anybody will pick that up. <laughs> and they do, I'll tell you, friends. They have pass keys, those people that work for those places, and they have other ways of getting keys, like they'll run a room, make a mold of it, and then come in when somebody's rented it and clean the room out. Especially, you know, in areas where there are a lot of tourists. I praise God he preserved that trunk full of gear, but it never occurred to me to start worrying. It'd be too late then anyway, because... You know, so. We now are leaving Christian responsibility in the economic sphere. We've seen all about our responsibility in work, vocation, calling, money, possessions, now, Christian responsibility and the government. Well, it sounds a little repetitious, but there's nothing more important than what we're going to study. We say that about every heading, but... This is one where we'll separate the men from the boys. Really. I'm going to deal with the subject under three headings, three categories, so you'll know where you're going. One will be obedience to government and authority. Another heading, secondly, will be non-resistance. Now that includes all forms of non-resistance. Personal attacks against you, you don't resist. He says, turn the other cheek, you know that. Non-resistance, you don't resist government or authority, nor do you practice resistance on behalf of the government. In other words, it's non-resistance toward the government, non-resistance for the government. That deals with war and policing and things like that, for the Christian we're saying. And then the third category is politics and government service. So we'll deal with it under three headings. Obedience to government and authority, non-resistance, and politics, and government service. And if you'll hold your questions, I think we'll cover it all in the several weeks that we'll be dealing with this. No point asking questions that will be answered, because you can't answer them properly without teaching. If you could, then you would do it that way. Let me give you a very short bibliography for those of you who may want some books on this subject of non-resistance and politics and so forth. Now, we never recommend a book like everything in it is Bible truth, but it will open areas that we could never take time to touch in your thinking, and we assume that mature Christians can read some historical things where they set forth historical facts or they can read them with the ability to see where they're missing it. Uh, two of them, you'll have to get them from England because that's the only source I know. <laughs> but you tell your bookseller, like Brother Platt, he probably knows how to order them. All right, here's the name of one, The Early Christian Attitude to War. 
the early Christian attitude to war. Now, a lot of people ask me for books on subjects that we're teaching, especially in this area. And that's by C.J. Caddo. C.J. Caddo. C-A-D-O-U-X. And another by Caddo, The Early Church and the World. The Early Church and the World. Now, I can get the sources of the publishers if you need them on those, but I'm not going to bother with that because anybody who orders books from foreign markets, and by the way, England is... Um, source for literature where you can't find anywhere else. I've done a lot of buying from England. Another book that you can buy locally is War, Peace, and Non-Resistance. War, Peace, and Non-Resistance by Guy F. Hirschberger. <laughs> Would you need to guess that he's a Mennonite? <laughs> Guy F. Hirschberger, just like it sounds. Another, this one I used years ago, but it, I'm sure it's still in print. The New Testament, the Christian, and the State. The New Testament, the Christian, and the State. By A. Penner, P-E-N-N-E-R. Now there are others, but those four will keep you well informed. Caddo's books generally deal with the early history of non-resistance and politics and so forth. And they're authoritative as far as researchers are concerned. He deals with early manuscripts and all as his sources. The other two, I think both are Mennonites and deal with non-resistance from an Anabaptist point of view. Mennonites are Anabaptists like the Baptists. That isn't their background. Of course, Baptists now are not non-resistant. They were. They don't know that, but they were. <laughs> they used to pray for the sick, too, but... <laughs> All right, there are three areas, I said. The first is obedience to government and authority. That's the heading we'll start with. Obedience to government and authority. And I refer you to the tape on Romans chapter 13, where we deal with it in detail. Tonight, so you'll have it in your notes, I want to give you the four principles I deal with on that tape without a lot of comment, but so that you will have them before you. Now, you really should listen to the tape to get a comprehensive study of the fact that we are to obey all authority except where it would be disobedience to God. Now, I gave you four principles, and I said, first of all, that we must obey all authority because all powers and governments are ordained by God. Romans 13. All the powers that be, Paul says, are ordained of God. The Bible, without reservation, says we're to obey all authority, whether it's good or bad. We're to obey it because even if it's bad, God has raised it up for a purpose. Now, that is thoroughly dealt with, with much scripture proof, and so don't anybody look at me cross-eyed. All powers are ordained of God to fulfill God's purpose, whether good or bad. Egypt, Romans 9, 17, he said, I've raised you up. A wicked Pharaoh, you know, that wouldn't let the Israelites go. Assyria, Isaiah 10, he said, I've raised you up. You're the sword in my hand against my people to punish them. Babylon, Daniel 4, 17, even old wicked Nebuchadnezzar had to admit that his power was from God. Romans 13, 1 through 7, all the powers that be are ordained of God. There is no power but of God, and to disobey that power is to disobey God, for he is God's minister, and he says that three times in Romans 13. And who was the emperor when Paul wrote that to the Romans? Nero. 
that's a fact of history. All you have to do is read it for yourself. The history. Wicked Nero, who put thousands of Christians to death, he said he was raised up of God. Not to do what he did, but raised up of God. He represents authority. Oh, how the American Christians need to study their Bibles about what God says, because many of their problems they have in their churches and their homes their personal lives is because they don't understand the principle of authority. Another thing we said is that we can't disobey our government because it's politically corrupt or sinful is because all human government and authority is sinful and corrupt. It's only a matter of degree. The kingdom of the world belongs to Satan according to Luke chapter 4. So to resist every time they misuse their power would create constant chaos and that's what we've got. And that's why we've got it because we're tough to resist what we don't like. But the most wicked, tyrannical rule that ever existed was under the Roman rulers and the Christians were put to death for three centuries by the millions. And in every case, Peter and Paul and Jesus says, obey, obey, obey. Thirdly, we said, contrary to what we've been taught, rulers are accountable to God alone, not to the people that he has set the rulers over. <coughs> rulers are accountable to God alone who appoints them, not to the people that God has put the rulers over. And of course, in a nation like ours, all we hear is that they're accountable to the people, so we call it demos democracy, people rule. To begin with, it isn't people rule. It's not a democracy. As we've said, it's a republic. There's no such thing as democracy. It'd be impossible for it to work. 200 and, what, 10 million Americans, we'd have 210 million different opinions, literally. No way for a democracy to work. That's why it can't work in the church. We have to find out his mind and all have that mind. Because even when we're sincere, we don't always see alike. So we can't trust, you know, what our opinions are. But democracy is not God-ordained in the political realm or the spiritual. It is not the best form of government. And that isn't treason, it's just a fact that it would promote chaos. So we don't have democracy here, we have a republic. We elect representatives who go vote the way they please after they get elected. I say we, I mean the nation, we'll, we'll deal with whether or not a Christian should get involved in politics. As I say, they would have laughed you out of the church for the first three centuries when you talked about getting involved in any way, let alone working for the government. If they misuse their power, God will deal with them. Remember, David would not touch Saul when he had the chance. He said he's the Lord's anointed, and when he was dying and a Canaanite came to where he was dying and Saul said thrust me through so that they don't mutilate me and abuse me and so forth if they had found him still alive so he came and told David so I did what the king bade me do I thrust him through with his sword what did David do? <laughs> he said fall on him and kill him and so they slew the man he says weren't you afraid to touch the Lord's anointed? <laughs> well I'll tell you there's a different attitude in the Bible than you get in school and home and church No, it's a different attitude. And so we told you that Christ didn't rail against Herod when he beheld John. In fact, he himself went and hid himself. Whatever you think of that, that's what happened. He wasn't about to get slain before his time. Paul, when he was imprisoned by Nero, says, Obey him, pray for him, fear him. The apostles, when they slew James, did not get up a petition and march on the White House. The church, when the state murdered millions of Christians, did not retaliate, but in every case the apostles said, pray for them, obey them, and honor them. Another we gave you is that the principle of authority must be preserved. The principle of authority must be preserved. For a lot of reasons. God didn't say be subject just to good authority, to good rulers, but to all authority. 
because there's no power but of God. And there's no political system that ever pleased everyone. So, as I've said, we'd have constant strife and chaos and anarchy if every time they did something didn't please us. Sometimes I just, even though I know better than to let myself get agitated, I just have to turn the news off. Say I have to, I do it to keep from getting agitated because of the biased reporting and the ridiculous things that they do. They've just concluded another survey. I told you about the one where they spend your tax money and I forget how many, I think it was $250,000 to discover that young people are healthier and happier than old people. Uh. That's a rule. I was trying to think of that new one. Oh, isn't it? And if you let yourself get caught up in it, Governor Reagan had a whole list of them on a program one night. And I tell you, it would curl your hair. Where you? Millions of dollars just being spent, like, to find out the sex habits of a fly in South America, a certain type of fly. <laughs> Well, anyway, as I say, if you agitated and protested and spoke against every time you didn't agree with something, it would be constant chaos. God knows this, so the principle of authority has to be maintained. You respect it, even though you don't always agree with it, even though you know it's wrong. Now, not where you would sin, as I say, we're not talking about that, but as far as the principle, we must maintain it. Keep in mind that you're a president who will go in office only won by 3% of the votes. Whether it was 70 or 80 million votes cast, I don't recall, but let's say it's 70 million votes were cast, that means 35 million people have the right to agitate if you follow the red-blooded American way of life, to protest those and those things you don't agree with. That's terrible, 35 million people agitating. And many of the 35 million who voted for him are not sure they like a person who says he's a born-again Southern Baptist. They don't quite know what to do with him. And so even the news media, which is without exception liberal and pro-communist, I'll just say it all in one breath, if you followed it for years, you could see that. They make snide remarks about him, don't realize that that's contrary to Scripture. But even the man that they've helped elect, they don't know what to do with him, and they talk about those country people coming to Washington. And I have to discover real estate's more expensive up here. And but there's an attitude that we should maintain that God has ordained these rulers, and the one that gets in the office is the one to be respected because the principle of authority must be maintained. Why? To maintain law and order, there must be authority, or chaos will result. To restrain sin, there must be laws and order. God uses authority sometimes, we said, to punish the nations, like with Assyria. And keep in mind there's no one in this country that knows anything about bad government. We've never had bad government. If you want bad government, then you should have lived in the first century or in some of the communist countries today if you want to see what it is about not being permitted to come out and worship in freedom and so forth. However bad it may appear sometimes, it is just nothing compared to what Christians have had to endure and still are enduring. So we have little enough to do not to complain and to do what the Bible says. Our responsibility is to pray and obey, to obey and to pray. Obey, Romans 13, and the other passages we gave you, many others, Peter, Titus, and to pray, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 3. All right, that by way of introduction, since we have it thoroughly covered on the Romans 13 tape, that's all we're going to give you on. Our responsibility is to obey and to pray for. Then we'll start next time with non-resistance.